Well, good evening and welcome to Not Breda for this special Monday Thursday service uh, this evening. A uh, special welcome to friends from St Jude's and from St Field Road, uh, as well as our own Not Breda folk and maybe others uh, who are watching uh, on this uh, recording on YouTube. Uh, but we're delighted you're able to join us. We'd much rather prefer to have you here in the church with us, as we usually do at this time of the year, uh, for a Monday Thursday communion service. Uh, but that's just not possible, as you can understand, uh, with this pandemic at the moment. Uh, so we're doing as much as we can online, and I'm grateful to everyone who helps us uh, with these pre-records and with the music and also Johnny, who's doing a children's club online uh, this Holy Week every morning. Uh, so I'm grateful to all the efforts that are being put in. But you're very, very welcome uh, tonight as we share again from God's Word and from Luke's Gospel. And Ben Walker, uh, the minister at St. Field Road, will be sharing from uh, our passage for this evening. So I'm going to lead us in two prayers, a traditional Maundy Thursday prayer, and then also a prayer about the Garden of Gethsemane. And then I'll hand over to Rebecca. It's so great to have Rebecca with us uh, leading our praises. You might like to sing along with her at home. I know a lot of people do. Or just enjoy uh, Rebecca's playing and singing uh, God's praises. And then we'll go straight over to uh, Ben, who's recorded uh, a message for us just in the last day or two. So uh, we trust that you're well. Uh, we trust that you're continuing in faith, praying to the Lord, uh, reading and listening to his word. And uh, we pray, we want to, Share in prayer now. So we'll just bow our heads together, please. And I'll lead us in a prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, who of your tender love towards mankind has sent your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross, that all mankind should follow the example of his great humility, mercifully grant that we may both follow the example of his patience and also be made partakers of his resurrection, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we also pray, remembering uh, this evening, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Almighty God, your Son Jesus Christ, on the night of his arrest, gathered with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, we thank you that he accepted there the bitter cup of suffering in submission to his Father's will, that he was prepared to face the agony of the cross to save us from our sin and from your judgment. Have mercy on our weakness. Arm us with so much strength and courage that we may fulfil our duty, taking up our cross, following the path of our Saviour, watching and praying till your return. So may we resist all temptation for the honour and glory of his saving name. Amen. Now we're going to have a time of praise with uh, Rebecca and just as I hand over to her a verse uh, from Peter's first letter chapter 2 and verse 24 as we think about the cross afresh uh, this week, this holy week, uh, the story of Jesus and the cross. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So we sing the praise of the one who bore our sins in our first song, Rebecca.
We read from Luke chapter 22, verse 66 to chapter 23, verse 25. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. If you're the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you would not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you then the Son of God? He replied, you say that I am. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony We've heard it from his own lips. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be a Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You've said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted, he stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he'd been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they'd been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I've examined him in your presence and I've found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he's done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. With one voice they cried out, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Now Barabbas had been thrown in prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore I will have him punished, and then release him. But with loud shouts they insistently demanded that he be crucified and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. Who is on the throne? Who is sitting in the seat of power? Who's in charge? When the world around is spiralling, who is the authoritative calm in the middle of the storm? The chief priests and the teachers of the law, as we heard, made their play to be seated at the centre of power. They've been planning to take down the threat that is Jesus, and here they are at this stage in the week, 
flexing their political muscles to do so. They have Pilate over a barrel to execute the findings of their own pseudo-trial. This guy opposes Caesar. He's making himself out to be a king. They crank up the political pressure and the public pressure on Pilate, insistently demanding that Jesus be crucified. And they seem to have the power. Jesus has surrendered to their will. But these chief priests are those who are to carry the messianic hope of the people of God. Yet when they're confronted with that Messiah, their king, they choose Caesar, Roman rule, Roman taxes instead. Their ancestors from generations before, who won freedom from foreign rule, they'd be spinning in their graves. And then there would be those who would be massacred by Rome at the uprising in 70 AD, just 40 years after this event, just a few years after Luke was writing this. It was Caesar they would fight against and brutally lose too. Look at what rejecting Jesus does to them, to anyone. Look at what sacrificing truth does in seeking power to get what you want. You get the end you think you want, but it doesn't last and it costs your very soul. They're not power players, just debris in the bigger storm. What about Pilate, the governor? He sits in the seat, doesn't he, that decides life and death. He chooses whom he will release and who will be crucified. He steps in forcefully to state that Jesus is innocent in all this. Surely Pilate is the one in charge. But he's pressed on both sides. He lives under the authority and the fear of Caesar above him. And he cannot but give in to the loud shouts of the populace below. Despite his better judgment, Pilate is not powerful. He's weak. He's not the man on the true seat of power. He's not at the centre of it all. And neither is Herod, the king. A king, but with a limited jurisdiction. A king who can't get the answers and the performance he demands. A puppet king. Playful, a player, he might think, making friends in all the right places, but really just a pawn in the hands of Caesar. So surely it is Caesar here who is the one who is truly in charge. It's Caesar who rules. Isn't it? It's Caesar to whom they pay their due. It's Caesar whom they must not oppose. It is Caesar whom they fear. It's Caesar who will one day exile Pilate and massacre these Jews. Caesar, the embodiment of worldly authority, the power behind it all. He's in control. He chooses who dies and who will be saved. And yet there were four Caesars who reigned between the events Luke describes and his time of writing it. We're not sure any of them died of natural causes. Is anyone lastingly in power and control? And isn't that one of the things that COVID-19 is unveiling in our world. We're not sure if anyone is really lastingly in control. Who is on the throne? Who is the calm in the spiraling storm? If I told you, would you believe me? 
If I asked you, would you answer? From now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of mighty God. While everyone else plays for power in those early hours of that morning, there is one who seems led like a lamb to the slaughter, innocent of crime, a victim of others, surrendered unjustly in place of a murderer. But he is powerfully silent throughout, a disquieting, holy self-control. The one who by rights sits on the throne of heaven humbles himself to death on a cross. He's mocked for being the king he truly is. He lets himself, the innocent one, be surrendered to crucifixion so that the guilty one by God's grace alone and call me Barabbas may go free. I went to a school that was a Church of England school and affiliated with the cathedral and we used to go to the cathedral maybe a couple of times a term for prize giving or a service or something or other. And there I used to sit in this high and lofty house of worship where a little way below the vaulted ceiling uh, hung a huge cross. And there were some words of Latin at the top of that cross. And I never bothered with them when I was at school. I never knew what they meant. But it was later on in watching a terrific documentary that I discovered what they were. Stat crux dom volvita orbis. I don't know if you know Latin, but they're, they're words, apparently the motto of some Carthusian monks from a thousand years ago. But a motto so encapsulating biblical truth and the biblical truth that comes through here. Words that then have stuck with me. Stat crux dom volvita orbis. The cross stands while the world revolves. The cross stands while the world revolves. We live in a revolving, spiralling world um, where people continue to grab power and lose power, to seek to be in charge, to claim that they're in control. It happens at the highest level and it happens right down to us too. We who think the world revolves around us. We who try to remove Jesus or move him to the margins. We who give in to the temptation to sacrifice truth and love for the ends and the control and the power we desire. But it only ends in us and others getting damaged we live in a spiralling, revolving world where in the end, we're not always sure that anything or anyone is in control. But through it all, the cross stands. The gospel message of Jesus, the King who came to die for us, that we the guilty might have life, that message stands. The one who, in the middle of everything, nations raging, kingdoms tottering, says, be still and know that I am God. The one exalted on the cross and on the throne over the nations forever. In our whirling, broken world, here is authority. Here is truth. Here is peace. Here is hope. In the one who was led like a lamb to the slaughter, stricken for us. Jesus Christ. <laughs>